All right, we're live to the public now. All right, ready to do this? I'm ready. Okay. So I can stop my camera from shaking. Here we go. All right, folks, I'm sitting here virtually across the pond here with Mr. David Thorpe. He's a photographer based in London. He's been shooting for over 50 years, and he's, he's which in that time span, of course, he's seen probably almost everything. So he's seen the evolution of photography from, you know, the more primitive cameras all the way up to the most advanced mirrorless and DSLRs that we have today. So David operates a really cool uh, YouTube channel, that's where I found him, that, uh, you know, he reviews different pieces of gear, talks about the merits of them, compares gear and cameras and bodies and all that stuff, plus he's also still an active shooter. So, um, I invited him to come on This Week in Photo to chat about his history a little bit and also dive into some of the perceptions around certain kinds of cameras that have been in the news lately. So, Mr. Thorpe, welcome to This Week in Photo. Thank you very much, Frederick. It's great to have you here. Okay, so let's start off with you. So we were chatting offline a little bit a few minutes ago about just a little bit about your history, and I wanted to make sure we recorded it, so I stopped it. So what, you, you've you been shooting for a long time. When did you, what, what got you into photography, and what was some of the first gear that you got your hands on? Well, I'd never picked up a camera until I was leaving school, and I needed a job. And my father noticed a job advertised for the local newspaper down in Kent, near London, where I lived. Mm -hmm. And I applied for the job, and I got it. And that's when I picked up, uh, I picked up my first camera. So wow. I never had an interest in photography whatsoever. Wow! And then it just stuck with you from then. You, so from that point forward, you were a photographer, a professional photographer. That's right. And there were nine photographers there, and they they trained me up and and had me making tea and coffee for them and all the stuff that you do and a lot of time in the dark room. But one of the things that happened was that as soon as I picked up a camera, uh, and I mean this was a big old thing called a VN plate camera, so a nine by twelve centimeter wow. plate. I mean really primitive, no. Uh, no rangefinder, no nothing. 150 millimeter standard lens. You know, if you if you make a mistake with that, you're way way out. Not like not like now. But you learn to judge it to within an inch. You know, just just because you because human beings can do that. Yeah. And I I just after I picked up that camera, just everything. I don't know. It just seems so exciting. And uh, and I used to take pictures of my grandmother and dogs and cats. You know, it's supposed to be my job, but I couldn't stop doing it. And you and you kept doing it clearly. <laughs> and I, I kept doing it, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and so you've seen the evolution from that that nine by twelve centimeter camera all the way up to these tiny sensors that we have today, relatively yeah. speaking, right? These yeah. little micro four thirds sensors. Yes. What, so just from a high level, looking at that evolution, what have we, or what have you as a professional photographer, lost? from going from those big, you know, those big, large sensor or film cameras all the way down to the Micro Four Thirds. What have you lost and what have you gained, do you think? Lost? Okay. In a, in a technical sense, nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these cameras now, I mean, they're really, they're as good as the old ones ever were. Um, by, the, by, right, what have I lost? Okay, one of the things about the big cameras was that before you took pictures, you had to think... Yeah. Because you know there wasn't because without the automation, mm -hmm. you had to learn techniques. You really, in those days, you had to learn to be able. To, you know, you had to learn to print your own stuff. So I think it gave you an insight into into photography fr from a much lower level than people get nowadays. Uh, because you know, because I, I often say to people uh, when they're you know they're they're fretting about technique and so on. You know, with these cameras, just put it on auto and shoot away. Don't worry about it. Um, if it's taking pictures you want to do, but you will, in, you, but you will eventually want to control the thing. Mm -hmm. But the yep. great thing is, you know, but then you didn't have that possibility of the auto. You only had the control. So it was a much harder, it was a much harder thing to learn photography in those days. Yeah, that that feed. I call it the feedback loop, right? So that feedback loop of when you take a photo and uh, you know, so you have in your mind's eye, yeah, I want to take a picture of this fire hydrant, and I want the background out of focus, so as a professional photographer, you know I need to shoot with a wide aperture, this, that, and, and the other thing, and you take the shot. Today, with yeah. digital, you take the shot, you look at the back of the camera, it's wrong, you make some adjustments, take the photo, and it's what you thought, so you build yes. those, you know what you got quicker, rather yes. than back then with film, 
there was days or more between that feedback yeah. getting back to your brain, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things that, okay, that's, this is interesting what you've just brought up because one of the things that I notice about that people do a lot now is they will shoot tens, twenties, hundreds of pictures uh, on, on something. I mean, a wedding photographer is taking 5,000 shots on a wedding. Yeah. Do you know, rarely do I photograph anything where I take more than two or three frames of it. Wow, really? So you're not the yeah. continuous high, press the shutter and spray and pray no. guy, right? No, no, because I think because I think what happens is it just you, you, it, I mean, it would happen with anything. You, you've got such a wealth of experience that in a way, I I know what the picture will look like before I take it because that's what I want it to look like. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess, um, and you know, I mean, that's that, that's that's a skill that you acquire just as musicians, you know, can pick up an instrument and play any tune. It's they're not cleverer than other people, but they've been doing it an awfully long time. Yeah, and and every day. Point. Yeah, repetition. Yeah, yeah, repetition. I mean, you've you've made all the mistakes, and uh, and you still make them, of course. Right. Uh, well, it's called learning and, and and growing and experimenting. So let's talk talk about that a little bit. So the on the gear side. So on your on your YouTube YouTube channel, you're you've made the transition fully into Micro Four Thirds, and you're yes. shooting. I believe you're you're primarily Olympus with, on the Olympus side of things. Is that correct? No, no. The camera bodies are um the cam the camera bodies are uh, all I've got are Panasonic. In fact. Oh, Panasonic. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, but, that's but what I'm I've shooting got, too. Yeah, but I've got a good few um Olympus lenses. Okay, so I, then, I like I like their primes. You like the okay, so I, I want to talk about that because I have a couple yeah. of those primes, and I this is a selfish interview because I want to pick your brain about that. <laughs> but the uh, on the so moving, so what I'm really curious about is moving. So you've been shooting for over 50 years, and so you've seen the body evolution or the camera technology evolution yes. from the first digital cameras up through these full frame monsters that are amazing that make these great great images. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the micro four thirds. So yeah. where where was that point of inflection where you said, you know what, I'm not shooting these full frame DSLRs anymore, and I'm going to move to these smaller micro four thirds. So where was that, and why did you make that choice? Well, I, it was interesting. I, I uh, the work I was doing, I gave up in the in the late nineties, and I had been doing photography for so long that I went to a camera shop and I sold all my cameras, every every single one of them. The Nikons, I had Nikons, Hasselblads, Mamiya 6.7s, the whole lot. I, I've just been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. And I just sold all my cameras and I thought, well, I was a photographer and I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not anymore. And I, I, I got a job in um, a big computer place, Capgemini it's called, as an internet consultant for them, showing people over the internet and so on. Mm -hmm. And... Then out came, I I was interested in the digital cameras, but they weren't very good at that time. This is like 1997, 98. They were toys, really, compared with what I, for what I was, you know, from my perspective, they were toys. Then I, th then the Nikon Coolpix came out, mm -hmm. and, and I think it was about 2 megapixel or something. But, you know, it was getting to the point where you could get a decent 6-inch print off it if you wanted to. Yeah. And I bought one of those, and I found it, because I could just put it in my pocket, it was such a pleasure to use, that I, that I fooled around with various little Canon Ixus and things like that, just purely for fun, not, not doing anything professionally at all, or for money or for work at all. And then gradually I started getting my interest in photography, you know, which was sort of dormant, but it just came back. And I bought a, um, a, a Pentax, was it? I forget you know which one it was, but, but a, a Pentax, uh, I think it was 16 megapixels. Uh, and one of the reasons I bought the Pentax was it was a small body. This would have been this wasn't been that long ago, about 2008, something like that. Yeah, okay. That was an APS-C, mm -hmm. and that was brilliant, and I loved the thing. But uh, I was back into the old thing of hauling whacking great lenses around again. And a camera bag that broke my back, and I cycle a lot, and I take my cameras with me, and you know, it, it spoils my cycling, and yeah. they're meant to complement each other, not you know, not fight one another. Right, right. And, uh, and um, then I saw the uh, a, a GF1 Panasonic, a little Panasonic, mm -hmm. and I 
bought one and I and I, I tested it out and I just thought the capabilities were they weren't as good as the APS-C at the time, but they were good enough. And I was using it as a second camera because that was the idea. And then, but, but then they started improving. And suddenly, then I'm, then I'm thinking, well, why am I using two camera systems with two different sets of lenses when, when, when even at that early stage, the micro four thirds, by the time, okay, when the GH2 came along, by that point, the image quality was really as good as 35 millimeter ever was. In many respects, no, 35 millimeter film, in many respects, better. And at that point, there was no point, I, I didn't see any point in having bigger cameras. Yeah. I mean, one of the things about my, being, I think, about being a professional is that, uh, you know, if you're a professional driver or what is, you don't buy, you don't buy, they're tools. So you buy what you need to do the job. You don't carry a bigger one if you don't need a bigger one. You know, yes. it's, it's your working life. Yep. Uh, and so I've always approached it very much like that. You know, these things are tools. And what happened was that the Macro Four Thirds just they they just became I thought the best tool for the job. They 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 balanced up between the quality you needed. Now, not maybe the quality you might want, but the quality you needed, which is more important to me. Uh, and incredibly, uh, what pragmatic, efficient things. Yeah, and lightweight, and the, the lenses are just... Yeah, that was one of the things that, that got me when... It was like last year, maybe the beginning of last year, when I started really, really considering Micro Four Thirds seriously. And the the one thing that kind of took me back a little bit... I've been a Nikon shooter for years, so I have, you know, I don't know, you know, half a dozen or so Nikon lenses, you know, and the the the, the requisite... You know, 70 to 200, 24 to 70, you know, all those guys. Yeah. And the, yeah. the size comparison between the Micro Four Thirds and the, the, the DSLR lenses, it took me back a little bit because I was thinking, well, the quality can't be that good from this tiny little, you know, lens as big as this big one because bigger is better, heavier, it's a monster. Yeah. This yeah. thing I can put in my back pocket, how can I expect to get that level of quality? So there was mm -hmm. that jump. You know, is there anything you can say to that? I mean, because a lot of people, I'm sure, are in the same boat thinking, yeah, I mean, those those lenses are toys compared to these big Canon white yes. lenses that I use. <clears throat> well, first of all, I mean, I think you've got to think, what are you using the camera for? I mean, if you're if you're shooting for websites, if you're shooting for uh, on on screen use, I mean, how many people have a screen that's that's five thousand pixels across? I mean, even with a micro four thirds. A lot of what you're doing, you're discarding the quality when you when you're when you're viewing on a screen. Uh, so, so you've you, you see, so, but I mean, the argument there's always an argument, of course. What you, when you've got the absolute top quality that you can get, then you can discard quality. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't put it back in if you don't have it in the first place. I think that's the hump that Micro Four Thirds overcame. It's got enough quality. But, you know, like, I mean, the old joke about the, the, the jumbo jet pilots, you know, why, um, why has it got four inches? Well, there's no room for a fifth. You know, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> the more engines you could have, the better. And I felt the same way. I mean, if you, uh, it, it, I wouldn't use a full frame if I could conveniently use a medium format. Yeah. You know, yeah. why, why, why not have a... Why not have a 70 millimeter? It's always going to be better. You can always discard quality, but you but you've got to take into account the the practicalities of the thing. And I think that um, I, I I don't have a full frame camera, and I mean I always used to work with them, of course, because they were film. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not sure what the advantage is now, except one, except one. What and what's that one? And that's the old one that people always talk about: micro four thirds and and in and, and the, the depth of field. Right. Right. Yeah, I read an article the other day that was that that tackled that issue, and it and I'll 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 link to it. I think I shared it on on Google Plus and Twitter. But it was basically the author. She was writing, and she said the the argument about depth of field or the lack thereof on on smaller sensor cameras like Micro Four Thirds is in some ways moot because it's it's a depth of field is a function of the distance from the sensor or the lens to the subject and the subject to the background that you want out of focus if yeah. you want a a more out of focus background move the subject 
forward and step back. <laughs> so, in other words, move the background further away from the subject sure. if possible. So, but, which but works fact, in some but, cases. Well, it does, but of course, the fact remains that um, I mean, depth of field in time more or less depends on two things: distance and and mm -hmm. the size of the hole the light's coming through, right. and there will always be more on micro four thirds, which is often an advantage, of course. I mean, for every picture, I'm, I'm sure for every four pictures I take, the extra depth of field is, is an advantage for what I do, for, you know, not, not a disadvantage. But, but if you really want that, you know, that beautiful, really smashed out, out of existence background, if that's what you really want, then you need to, you need to keep a, a full frame camera in your back. Yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. way around that. It's, it's the right tool for the right job, you know. You yeah, can't... that's exact. Well, that's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. Don't don't complain that you know the the little small car that you bought is not a race car. Buy a race car if you want to ride. Yeah, right. <laughs> drive races. I, I've made my hassle. My Hasselblad used to make me a lot of money because because I used to use the 150 millimeter lens on that equivalent to what I don't know an 85 I suppose mm -hmm. uh, on, um, uh, on on full frame yeah. and. That lens made me money because I could sell pictures on the basis. I, I would just get an attractive girl, you know, um, a singer or whatever. You can just do the most beautiful pictures just by controlling that background, putting it right out of focus, or just bringing in just what you want. You got all that control. So in in that respect, that made full frame look a bit second rate back yeah. then. Right. You know, right. the hassle the hassle blade would really do it. So so then, so then that said though. Uh, so does does that mean that that these smaller sensors, micro four thirds, um, would not be the ideal selection for someone that wants to do portraiture and models and and that sort of thing? I I don't find any problem with it generally because I've got my little favorite uh, of all of, of all the micro four lenses. What I think is the most wonderful little one of them is the forty five millimeter Olympus. I knew you were going to say that. That's oh, my well, favorite lens too. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's. I mean, it's not only tiny and sharp. But it's cheap. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible bit of work. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. it, actually, to me, that if you're going to talk about anybody who talks about the heart and soul of micro four thirds, I mean, that little lens just put against the background and photograph that. That's what it's about. You know, with a matchbox beside it, say, that'll yeah. tell you everything about it. And then look at the results you can get. You know, you can shoot wide open, or I shoot. We often use it about f2 for portraits. I don't have. There's enough. It, it's it's shallow enough for what I need. Yeah. Yeah. For what I need, so. That's that that lens is one of the first lens that I lenses that I purchased. In fact, when I when I bought my Olympus OMD EM5, that was one of the lenses that I got with it. You know, because yeah. that was after yeah. reading. I think I may have seen one of your reviews and some other reviews. I, that was on my list list of must have lenses, and I wasn't. I still yeah. don't regret it. In fact, no. I use that lens primarily if I do videos of myself and you know interviews and that yes. sort of thing. It's yes. perfect for that. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah, and great. It's a great little landscape lens too. It's. Yes, I mean, it's I a great lens. I haven't done that. I haven't shot landscapes with it yet. Yeah, yeah, I find it so. I mean, when you when you're doing things, when you're photographing mountains, you know, where a wide angle lens just takes in too much and makes it all look too small, and mm -hmm. you kind of show the scale of it by showing the, but by, by isolating parts of it, and then it's brilliant for that. I've got I go down to the France near the near the near the Pyrenees. Uh, on the, the French-Spanish border a lot. I've got a house down there, and um, house that sounds grand. It's a place down there, and um, I, I do quite a few landscapes down in the Pyrenees, and that's one of the prime main lenses I use down there for it. Wow. The forty-five. Yeah. That's great. Love that little lens. So yeah. let's let's talk about that a little bit before before we wrap this up. The the what is in your opinion, and this you're the source, right? So this is the perfect question to ask you. What is the ideal micro four thirds kit? You know what's what's in the bag for the ideal kit. And I know you're gonna okay. say it depends on what they're shooting, but generally speaking. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, look. Generally speaking, I, I I've made no secret of the fact that the the the, the GH3 to me with the battery grip on it, it just comes close to my ideal camera because it it you know there's things missing on it, I suppose, but it just feels great in my hands. And and when you put one of the bigger lenses, you know, one of the two eight zooms on it. They feel balanced and good on it, but it feels great with the 45, and it feels good with the 17 too. Yeah. Um, so that would be it. Then, I mean, I guess the other one would actually be, being honest, the the, the, the IMD mm -hmm. would be the other one. I mean, either of those, either of those two cameras, 
uh, I chose the GH3 purely on the basis that it was a bit bigger, and I added the battery grip on it to make it even bigger. So, you know, that's a personal thing, probably yeah. because I'm used to bigger, heavier cameras. Uh, and so, although that's not big and heavy, it, make, it, 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 it feels nice and solid. Yeah. In my the cool, hands. The cool thing about that, I think, is that, yeah, you can you can even if you own both of those camera bodies, your investment in lenses is interchangeable between the two because of the Micro wow. Four Thirds format, which was blew my mind coming from the Nikon world. You know? Yeah, honestly, Frederick, it, it, if I were to go back twenty five years to when I was working, that would have been my dream. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I had I had I had a couple of Leicas and some lenses, which I used for carrying around and. You know, when you when you've been a press man and stuff, you, being without a camera is very difficult. You, 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 I mean, you just feel you have to have a camera with you. It's just, it's just habit. Yeah. So I mean, I have a camera with me now when I go out to post a letter. You know, it's just <laughs> that's yeah. how it is. Now, and, what, um, David, what about glass though? You know, so ideal the ideal camera body for you, the GH3, right, with the battery yeah. grip on it. What about glass? What's what's the ideal complement of glass to to if you had the ideal kit and you were rebuilding it today, I've I've, I've got it actually. Um, I mean, it's the seven to fourteen uh, Panasonic zoom, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which I which I which is a which I really rate. Just shame about it, you can't fit filters to it or anything. But uh, you know, nonetheless, I mean, it's a great lens. The twelve to thirty five or the or the twelve to forty uh, Olympus, either one of those would do. Mm -hmm. The thirty five to one hundred um, to eight. And I've also got the uh, the the one to three hundred um, Panasonic zoom, which I don't always take with me. But you know, again, I get it all in a tiny case that fits on my back. That I mean, one of my Nikon's would have weighed as much as that with a standard lens on it. So yeah, yeah. But I mean, I've I've done a video about you know why I use it, and I, I I did a little shot on it of me picking up my camera bag with all those items in it, but on my little finger. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I mean, See that? That's, you say? Right. It can't possibly. That kit can't possibly make good images being that light. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Crazy. <laughs> Honestly, you could earn a living with it, and I understand. I'm reading that some of the some of the guys, Ian Berry and some of the guys from Magnum, are in Syria, are using them. Yeah. I, I can't think of a more perfect camera for it. Right. I just yeah. can't think of anything better. Cool. So then, okay, what what's next for you? For you know, or I'm looking on your your Google Plus page. The latest thing that you've, uh, I think you posted a, a review of the Panasonic 2514. Um, the last the thing I did was the GM1. Oh, the GM1, the little one. Yeah. The little one. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What did you think of that? Give us a preview of the review. Uh, oh, I've, it's already on there. But I, I think it's I think it's an amazing piece of work, and I I just don't know how they did it. And he's even got a flash in it and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the, the, it, it it is about the size with it. And I think that if you uh, it, it, if I mean it's got the same sensor as the GX7 and so on. But the fact remains, you don't have a swiveling screen, and there's 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 a good bit of stuff missing off it. And you know, I, and again because of my background, a, a camera without an eye level finder is Missing something to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really it, need, it, I need it, an eye level finder. Looking at that little thing, it looks like a camera that you would just, if you're going out for dinner and you don't want to bring a large body with yeah. you, but like you said, you're, you know, a former newsman, you want a camera with you that can, yeah. that can get the shot. That yeah. thing has a GX7 sensor in it. You that's can get right. the shot with it. You know. That's right. So you're never going to be without one. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, that's wonderful. So what's what's next for you? What's the what's the next review that you have teed up to to throw onto your YouTube channel? I'm trying to get uh, I'm trying to get hold of a 12 to 40 Olympus because I really fancy having a look at one of those the oh. the the, the, the two eight. Yeah. But um, it's hard to get hold of stuff because I mean Olympus don't you know, they, I, I uh, email them and so on but they don't reply and Panasonic you know these great big corporations uh, you know these minnows like me so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Have you seen that Olympus, the new one, the Olympus uh, OMD EM10? I think it is. Yeah, that looks like a, that. That looks a brilliant camera to me. Yeah, I was I was very fond of the EPL5 too because you've you've got that um you've got that Sony sensor in it, so you know you've got this little camera, and then you've got this fantastic quality coming off it. Yeah, it's, it's, it just seems wrong some way. I don't know. <laughs> No, that's it's what wrong I wrong and right at the same time. <laughs> yes, that's right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's great. Well, David, thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to chat with oh, me. It's a great is, pleasure. You know, it's been an honor, you know, talking with someone that's been shooting. You've been shooting longer than I've been on the planet. So, you know. <laughs>
it's, it's awesome. And you're shooting. The, the cool thing about it, you've been shooting, so you have, you've probably forgotten more about photography than I know. Uh, and you've made the decision to move into Micro Four Thirds, which somehow validates my decision to be shooting with my GX7. So, I, you know, I feel no validated. Matter how, no matter how hard I think about that, I, ca I can't fault that decision. Thank you. Good, good, good. All right. All right. Well, you have a good rest of your day. And uh, once again, thanks for coming on This Week in Photo. Yeah, great pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.